Good afternoon and welcome back. In this video we're going to take some logic that we had previously and we're going to drop this into its own function and this is going to be a really cool way I think that we can uh, use the curve functionality inside of the Unreal Engine which is something that I haven't seen many people using and it can be a really handy alternative and something to know about if you're adding things like game fill mechanics and your own kind of fill to jump curves and things like that. So the first thing we need to do to get this started is in the blueprints folder, I'm just going to right click, go to the misc section, and we're gonna create a curve. This is obviously gonna be the important thing for using curves in a function. And the one that we want is a curve float. So we're gonna create this, and I'm just gonna call this the camera curve. Now we need to double click inside of the camera curve, and this is very similar to what we've seen in the timeline. So just to refresh and recap here, if we click into our timeline, we're essentially just recreating this track here. And all that we had inside of that were two different point values. So we can do the same thing again. We can shift and left click to create our two points. I'm gonna get the first one and I'm gonna set this to a time of zero and a value of zero. And I'm gonna get the second and I'll give this a time of one and a value of one. Now, like we did previously as well, we just need to drag select both of these, right click on either and select auto. And we've got exactly the same curve as we had previously. So this is just gonna give us the same effect, but we will see as we go through this video uh, why it can be useful to know how to use these and also that they can be a little bit more flexible than things like timelines. Okay, so if we save, make sure that we save this and head on back over to the BP underscore camera pawn. Inside of the event graph, there's gonna be a few things that we need to do first of all. Now before collapsing this into its own function, I'm gonna do this kind of step by step and we'll add bits on uh, in a kind of Frankenstein approach so that we can see what's changing and what is being affected by our changes. So the very first thing we need to do is create a reference to our camera curve. And the way we do this is through a variable. So we're gonna create a new variable. And again, we'll just call this camera curve. If we just head on over to the variable type, type in float curve, and we can see the option for a curve float either, even, and we'll get the object reference. If we hit compile here, we can see that we have the option to uh, get a drop down, and it will find any curves that we've made in the project. And this is just gonna be the one that we created in the blueprints folder just a moment ago. Now with that done, we're just gonna drop some logic below this. So we're gonna get the camera curve. We'll control drag, select, and drop that into the event graph. We'll pull off of this, and we want to get the current float value. Okay, so we've got the get float value node, and all this is really doing is over a certain period of time, which is what we're going to be passing in, it's gonna get the current float value from the curve and return it just here which is pretty much what this is doing over time, but it's just doing it for us automatically. So before making any changes, obviously what we're going to do is replace the alpha from the animation with the alpha from our curve. But at the moment, of course, we don't have anything tracking the current time. So if we head on down to our event tick, uh, that is the only problem with using this is it will add a little bit more compilation to the event tick, but we're gonna do a branch check so it won't actually be doing this all of the time anyway. So what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna copy any of our float values that we have at the moment. Uh, we'll just rename this to elapsed time and we'll hit compile and we'll just reset this to zero to make sure that it's not doing anything strange. And what we want to do is during the event tick, we will set the value of elapsed time. So what we need is the current elapsed time. We're going to add a float to this, and that's just going to be our delta seconds. So we're actually, that's the wrong way around. We want to get the elapsed time, and we'll just do it this way for tidiness as well. And we'll set this to be our elapsed time value. Okay, now on top of this, we also need another float, and we're gonna call this one the curve length. And this is gonna be something that, unfortunately, we can only hard code, but you'll see as well in a moment that this will actually give us a little bit of extra flexibility, which is quite nice. Uh, now this essentially just needs to match the total length that we have of uh, values in our curve. So for, for this example, for me, it's gonna be one second. So I'm just gonna set this to a default of one for the curve length. Reason being then is that we're going to do another float check. So we're gonna say, see if the current elapsed time is more than our curve length. So we'll just plug this in. We'll do a branch check off of this. And then if that's the case, then we want to reset our elapsed time. So we're just gonna set this back to zero. Okay, and that's pretty much it. So you can see that when this is happening, we're going to be adding the delta seconds to the time. Uh, and we're gonna do that until the elapsed time reaches the length of the curve, which is gonna take a second to do. And that's what's gonna be driving our float value here. So we can just for now plug in the elapsed time and we're getting close to being ready to go. And I forgot the important thing uh, is if we come back here, uh, this isn't where we want to call the move to focused actor anymore. So we can actually just remove this altogether. What we wanted to do is come down to our event tick 
and we want to call this function multiple times because that's essentially what the timeline was doing for us because we're doing this on an update. So you only had to call the function once and it would run this until it got to the end. Now that's not going to be the same anymore. So we need to replace this with a call to our function in the event tick and we'll pass in the focused actor. So now when this is true, it's going to be calling this over and over until the elapsed time has returned to zero. So that's how we're going to be updating the value, which does mean we need to come back in once more to our handle move click. And of course, we just want to remove this call to the focused actor again. We still want to set the variable. We're going to set this to our true and focus, and that's going to be the bit which will toggle the function to be called. So now if we go back in again, we're going to wait a second. There we go, we focus straight into our actor. If we click to the other one, we'll focus to this one. And that is pretty much, you can see there, the same kind of functionality, but without using a timeline and just using the standard approach of having a function being called whilst the value is being updated. Now, the cool thing about doing it this way is if we were to change the curve length, we can actually get slightly different effects coming out with the curve. And this is something I saw on a Matthew Wadstein video, really, really cool series. The WTF series of functions just goes through different nodes and what they do. Definitely recommend checking those out. And when I was looking at some of the stuff he'd made on curves, he showed this really cool approach of changing the way that the, the curve or the float value is read in. So what we want to do is rather than just passing in the event or the elapsed time, uh, we're going to get the elapsed time divided by the curve length. So we'll do a divided by float and we'll pass in the curve length here and we'll plug this value into our in time. So if we leave this at one, this is going to do exactly the same thing. This is just going to be our standard one second movement over to the other actor. But the cool thing is if we do things like double or triple this, it will extend the animation relative to the value that we've input. So with this change to a higher value, I've chosen uh, the value of five here. What we should see now is this is going to take a longer period of time to zoom in, um, but we're still getting that same curve being used. And we can do this to different actors. Now, what I wanted to show here is once you've clicked on more than one actor, it's going to start snapping really quickly to the next one. Uh, and that's because we've got our calculation going on. A really simple fix to stop this is once we re-click on something. So again, we can do this in the handle mouse click. Uh, rather than trying to use the elapsed time from the value it's currently at in the event tick, we're just going to pull off in between the setting of the focused actor to the setting of the Boolean. We're just going to set the elapsed time back to zero. So what we should expect now, if we go back in, press play, it's going to do our initial zoom in. And then regardless of when we click on the other actors, it's just going to smoothly transition back over to that because the value has been set back to zero. So nice, simple fix. And we get a little bit of extra flexibility by using a float curve. Now, the final thing is if we wanted to go ahead with this approach, uh, I'm going to go back and just tidy things up one final time so we can get rid of things like the uh, the timeline. All of this is now good to be collapsed into a function because we're not using any latent functionalities. So we can collapse the function and we'll just call this the move to focused actor. Now, of course, because we already have our custom events called the same thing, we need to remove this first and then just add the actor back onto the name of the function and make sure that we rename the input to focused actor. Uh, in this case, I had to call it actor because for some reason it remembers the old one. Uh, probably need to compile that before we can redo this. Now we will need to come back through these and it's just found a few errors. We just need to refresh the node uh, because of the kind of on the fly edit that we made. But with that done, we can hit compile again and we can pass all of these back in as they were previously. So just to double check, there we go. That same function's working exactly the same way. Uh, no problems at all. And it now means it's just one less thing that we have in the event graph. Everything is housed quite nicely as functions where we can. Uh, the only real thing that we've got going on here it's some stuff we can't easily get rid of, or we could, but there's not very much point to hide this number of nodes. And the same for the uh, the event tick. Uh, we can kind of leave this where it is without too much of an issue. But other than that, hopefully this has been a useful insight on how to take a standard approach to blueprinting, kind of tidy things up as we go along, house everything in their own functions, and also a different way to do a lerping. And in a lot of things, when I was getting used to the engine, uh, I only really saw examples of using timelines for lerping and uh, rotating things. And I've only really seen curves used a lot of the time in C++. So I just wanted to take a bit of time to cover a way that we can get similar things done in Blueprint without the need of timelines, but with that kind of added flexibility that you get from using things like float curves opposed to animation timelines. But that's everything for this video. I think that pretty much wraps up everything I wanted to do on this camera system. Like I've mentioned in the past, this was mainly an idea just to take something that I've had on my system for quite a while now and figured would be quite useful for other people. 
Uh, hopefully this will be a good start point for your project. So if you're looking for a camera with similar functionality, hopefully it's going to be a good starting point and you can really build upon this and flesh things out to your project requirements. But I'll leave this video here for today. As always, if you've enjoyed the video or find these useful, please do leave a like and share the video around that always helps. And of course, don't forget to hit the subscribe button to be kept up to date with any of the content coming from any of the playlists on the channel. And as ever, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.